Hi everyone, welcome to the channel. In this video, I am going to explain the American and Australian academic hierarchies at colleges and universities. new to the channel, my name is Dr. Sam Monroe and I am an ecologist. That means I study plants and animals and how they interact with their environment. Here on YouTube, I like to make videos explaining ecology in film and media, but also talking about what it's like to be a scientist and work in academia. I have worked as an academic for over 10 years at different universities and I have to say, it's a pretty confusing place. Academia is its own strange little world with lots of twists and turns, and it often leaves people asking, what in the world is actually happening here? But not to worry, because in a video series I've decided to call Academy, huh? I am going to try and explain this weird little ecosystem that we call academia and how it all works. Today, I will be explaining the all-important academic hierarchy and talk about what scientists will be expected to do at each stage of their career if they work at a university. First things first, when I say academia, I am talking about the community of people that work in research and education at a university. An academic, like me, is someone who is a researcher or a teacher at a university. Academics at colleges and universities operate within a hierarchy of positions sometimes referred to as levels or ranks. Academics attempt to move up this hierarchy by demonstrating excellence in three main categories, research, teaching, and service. Service duties refer to administrative work, like sitting on a university committee. In order to be promoted, an academic must be a proven success in all three of these categories. You might think that the academic hierarchy system is universal in all universities around the world, but actually different countries and different universities have different hierarchy systems with different titles for different levels. In this video, I'm going to discuss and compare two major hierarchy academic systems. The first one I'm going to talk about is the one that's used in Canada and the United States, and the second one is the one that's used in Australia. I realize Australia isn't really that big by population standards, but we have quite a few universities, and I live in Australia, so we're going to talk about it. Let's begin with the United States and Canada, which have five main academic levels. Starting from lowest to highest, we begin with the postdoctoral fellow. This is an entry-level, non-tenure track position for a PhD graduate. Don't worry, I'm going to explain exactly what tenure is just a little later in the video. Next we have assistant professor. This is often a tenure track position, which can lead to promotion in the hierarchy. After that, there is the associate professor. This is a mid-level, usually tenured faculty position. After associate professor, we have professor, also sometimes referred to as full professor. A full professor is the final destination of the tenure track in an academic system. You can't really climb any higher than a full professor. The exception to this is the final level in the Canadian and US systems, which is if you are named a distinguished professor or a chair. These titles are only granted to a small percentage of the top faculty at a university. Sometimes, but not always, they are associated with financial endowments that have been made to the university. And they sometimes come with a little extra salary and a little bit of extra funding for their research. Essentially, a distinguished professor should be thought of as the cream of the crop. They have an amazing track record of research and teaching, and they are leaders and game changers in their field. Australia also has five main academic levels, but unlike the United States, we distinguish the levels using letters, not titles. Starting from lowest to highest, we have level A academics. This is also sometimes referred to as a postdoctoral fellow, and it is equivalent to a postdoctoral fellowship in the United States. This would be an entry-level position for a PhD graduate in Australia. Next up, we have Level B academics, sometimes also referred to as lecturers or research fellows. A Level B academic in Australia is roughly equivalent to an assistant professor in the United States. After that, we have Level C academics, sometimes referred to as senior lecturers or senior research fellows. These are roughly equivalent to being an associate professor in the United States. The next two levels is where the names start to get a little bit confusing. In Australia, after level C, we have level D, but this is sometimes called associate professor. However, it is roughly equivalent to being a professor or full professor in the United States. And last but not least, we have level E. 
This is also sometimes referred to in Australia as a professor, but it is roughly equivalent to being a distinguished professor or a chair in the United States. So right away we see one of the biggest differences between the Australian and American systems. In Australia, the title professor is reserved for really only the top academic faculty. In the United States, it's a little bit more of a job title. Now it's time for a brief mention of tenure. Tenure is a type of academic appointment that exists in the United States and Canada, but does not exist in Australia. In a nutshell, a tenured professor is someone who's basically been given lifetime employment. They cannot be fired except under the most extreme circumstances. This would include things like the financial ruin of the university or their entire department being eliminated. When people talk about tenure track positions in the United States and Canada, like being an assistant professor, what they're really saying is that maybe in future this job could become permanent. However, to receive tenure, you need to demonstrate that you are an extremely valuable asset to the university. A non-tenure track position would be the opposite. That type of position would have a fixed end date and there's no chance of that position becoming permanent. So tenure is a really big deal. It's job protection, but on top of that, it also often provides you with additional funds and freedom to speak your mind. You don't have to worry about getting fired, so tenured academics tend to say what they really think on different topics. For better or for worse, in Australia, we no longer have a tenure academic system. What we have now are basically three different types of contracts, casual, temporary, and continuing. Casual academics are hourly. They're usually hired to help out for a short period of time for teaching or research projects. However, there is no firm commitment from the university on the number of hours you will be paid to work. Temporary academic jobs are full or part-time contracts that have a fixed end date. They are also sometimes called fixed term contracts. These contracts will usually last between one to three years, but there is no guarantee of renewal and the university is under no obligation to continue your employment once you get to the end of your contract. Fixed term contracts are often given to postdoctoral fellows or grant funded researchers. And when the fellowship ends or when the grant money runs out, so does the contract. A continuing position, sometimes referred to as an ongoing or permanent position, is an open-ended position with no fixed end date for the contract. This usually means you are now directly paid by the university rather than getting your salary from an external grant. In that sense, a continuing contract is certainly more secure than a fixed term or temporary contract, but even someone who's hired on a permanent basis can be fired if they fail performance reviews or they can simply be made redundant. So it's not the same as having tenure. In the United States, an associate professor or above is usually a tenured position, but in Australia, it's equivalent, a level B or above could be permanent, but not necessarily. It's done much more on a contract by contract basis. It is important to understand that an academic cannot automatically progress through this hierarchy and absolutely nobody automatically gets tenure after a certain number of years. Getting tenure is a highly competitive process, and moving up the academic ladder in any country usually requires a formal application for promotion, and this process is time-consuming and is usually very stringent. Now that we know what the rankings are, let's talk about what you have to do at each level within the academic hierarchy if you want to be a success. Postdoctoral fellowships, or level A academic positions, are entry-level positions for new PhD graduates. As a postdoctoral fellow, you will likely be hired to work on a specific research project under the supervision of a more senior researcher. Your salary will usually be provided for by your supervisor through some kind of external grant that they've secured. However, some of you may have already earned your own external grant funding to cover your salary. Well done you. The purpose of a postdoctoral fellowship, sometimes called a postdoc, is to deepen and broaden your skills and basically introduce you into the wider world of academia. This means your supervisor should be providing you with opportunities for career enhancement and expanded training in your field. However, although you are still supervised, 
you will be expected to work far more independently than you did when you were a student. You want to prove that you can work independently and do your own research if you hope to move from a level A to a level B position, or from a postdoctoral fellowship to an assistant professor role. You may take on some teaching responsibilities, but this will vary depending on your contract. You may even take on a few research students of your own, but it's unlikely that you'll be their primary supervisor. You'll probably be a co-supervisor working with more senior academics. Ideally, you should be looking to get some grant funding, even if it's a small amount, to support your own research. And most importantly, you need to be publishing your work. Demonstrating your ability to bring in funding and publish your research are the two most important things that you can do to move up the academic hierarchy. At this stage, you may be expected to take on some minor service roles, but these will be simple things like peer reviewing papers or volunteering at university events. Now, the question that usually gets asked at this point is, how long do I have to be a level A or a postdoctoral fellow before I can move on up the ladder? And the frustrating answer is, how long's a piece of string? Some people may have to take on multiple postdoc positions, each being about one to three years long, potentially at very different institutions, before they gain enough experience to be promoted to the next level. Other people may only do one postdoc, again, one to three years long, before they're lucky enough to be moved up the ladder. It's really different for each person. As an assistant professor or a level B academic, everything steps up a notch. This level requires at least a PhD and usually several years of postdoctoral experience. At this stage, while you will still hopefully be getting some advice and mentorship from senior researchers, you will also be expected to do your own research independently. You will be managing your own research projects and likely leading small research teams of your own. And unless the university is paying for your salary, you will need to be bringing in grant money that covers not only your salary, but likely also some of your research costs and some of your students' costs as well. You might be teaching, but it really depends on your contract. In Australia, I know that some contracts, as little as 20% of a level B academic's time is dedicated to teaching, but it could be as much as 40 or 60%. Your service commitments are also about to increase. This can include things like sitting on a university committee or helping with outreach and recruitment. Most importantly, you need to be establishing a record of success, both in bringing in grant money and publishing high impact research. You need to be developing a reputation as an expert in your field. In Australia, you could be eligible to apply for promotion from level B to level C after just four years of graduating from your PhD. But honestly, how long you spend as a level B before you get promoted is really variable. Just like at being level A, you might have to move through different institutions before you can find a job where they promote you up to a level C. The good news is if you apply for promotion and you fail, take heart because you can reapply usually after a waiting period of about one year. In the United States and Canada with a tenure track system, it is completely different. An assistant professor usually has a contract that's about six to seven years long, and in the final year of that contract, they have to apply for a promotion to a tenured position. If the assistant professor passes their review, then they get promoted to associate professor and receive tenure. If they don't pass, they get fired and have to leave the university by the end of their final year. What? It's pretty rough. What this means is they either have to try and find another job at another university or leave academia altogether. An associate professor or a level C academic in Australia is expected to have a much larger role in the university. You will be expected to bring in large amounts of grant funding for research. If you're in the US system and you're tenured, you probably won't need to be supporting your own salary. But in Australia, there is a chance that you need to support both your research and your salary with the grant money that you bring in. You will also likely be supervising and financially supporting a team of students and junior academics. A level C academic is expected to conduct research that makes a significant contribution to their field, both nationally and internationally. Your work needs to be considered influential and important for expanding the discipline. This can be demonstrated in a variety of ways. For example, showing where your work has influenced government policy. If you're teaching, you're not only gonna be expected to deliver the curriculum, but also develop and evaluate the curriculum as well. At this stage, you also need to demonstrate your investment in the university's culture. You will likely serve on various committees, 
be an active voice in guiding the direction of the faculty and probably be helping to decide about other people getting promoted or hired at the university. To make it to level C or associate professor, you really have to have proven yourself with an incredibly competitive publication track record of really high impact manuscripts. A professor in the United States or a level D academic or associate professor in Australia makes what only can be described as an outstanding contribution to research, teaching, and service. In terms of research, a professor is expected to make original and innovative contributions to their field which are recognized nationally and internationally. A professor would be expected to manage a fairly large group of students, postdocs, and junior academics, and be bringing in all the funding to keep that ship afloat. A level D academic or full professor in the United States is expected to be a leader in the university community and heavily invested in the school's reputation. You will likely contribute to university governance and collegial life. You will also likely be involved in important departmental decisions. Really, the biggest difference between a level C and level D is all of this internal responsibility that you're expected to take. So I know what you're asking. How long does it take to become a full professor? Well, there really isn't a set amount of time that it takes to go from C to D or from associate to full professor. But on average, most people reach the rank of full professor by their mid 40s. But that's just an average. Some people will get there a little earlier. For some people, it might take a little longer. To run the full gauntlet of the academic hierarchy, it usually takes about 20 years after you graduate from a PhD. Finally, this brings us to level E, or what would be a distinguished or endowed professor in the United States or Canada. To reach this level, you must be considered eminent in your discipline. A level E academic will have achieved international recognition for their research over their lifetime. They will have also usually made substantial contributions to their community. And this can take on many forms. This can be like helping out government policy or or law enforcement, public education, the list goes on and on. A level E academic or distinguished professor provides leadership to the school where they help foster excellence at every level in terms of research and education. It is worth mentioning that both in the United States, Canada, and Australia, there is a hierarchy within professorships, a hierarchy within the hierarchy, if you will. In other words, once you make it to level E, you can get other positions. You can become a distinguished level E professor in Australia, for example, but at that point it's just getting really confusing and nebulous and it tends to vary depending on which university you work at. But just know that even once you reach level E or become a distinguished professor, there may be other roles and titles you can accumulate beyond that. Keep in mind though that many professors, that is level Ds or full professors in the United States and Canada, may never reach level E or become a distinguished professor, and that's fine. It's not really mandatory to completing your climb up the hierarchy. Most will stay at level D or be full professors for their entire career. Before I wrap up this video, there's just a few housekeeping issues I want to talk about for anybody who's trying to navigate this really crazy system. Typically, you're going to need a PhD in order to enter into that academic hierarchy, but this isn't always the case. In some disciplines, you can be appointed to a higher level position in the hierarchy without a PhD or extensive academic experience. Sometimes this happens because a master's degree is really all that you need to climb the academic hierarchy in that particular field. Some people may also be appointed to higher academic positions if they have a lot of relevant experience in industry or government. Essentially what this means is that while they don't have a doctor in front of their name, they have all of the experience that they need to work as an academic. Something else to remember if you're looking to apply for promotion, usually what's expected if you want to move, let's say, from level B to level C, is that you'll already have been working at a level C even though you're being paid like a level B. You basically have to show you already know how to do the job that you want to apply to be promoted to. It's frustrating, but that's how it works. All right, everyone, I hope after watching this, the Canadian, American, and Australian academic hierarchies make at least a little bit more sense. Tell me in the comments below, where are you in the academic hierarchy? How long did you spend at each level and how much did it make you want to rip your hair out? As always, if you found this video helpful, 
please like, share, and subscribe, and don't forget to hit that bell so you can get notified about the next video I do explaining the crazy world of academia.